Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to take the global stories that has made it to the front pages of our national dailies. And joining us to review the papers this morning is Professor Camillo Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning, and thank you for having me. Good morning. All right, so we'll begin with the business NG this morning. And this leads with the um, currency crisis. It says Naira sinks to 1,652 Naira per dollar from 307 in six years. The writers here says inflation soars from 11.4% in 33.8%. Um, and then CBN raises NPR 13 times in two years. I want to get your take on this. Just about six years ago, so that's um, in 2018, we're seeing now at 307. I know just before, um, by 2020, around the lockdown, that was when it went to about 400. But looking at that, um, f in four years, for, from 400 um, per dollar, to 1,600 that we are currently in. I want to get your take on this because, I mean, how did we even get here in the first place? Yeah, uh, we get uh, here uh, through bad economic policies mm. and through the debt that we have been incurring. The major source of this uh, decline in Naira uh, is the foreign debt that we have been incurring. Mm -hmm which comes up with uh, conditionalities and one of the conditionality is for us to devalue the naira which we do and uh, secondly uh, we erroneously believe that uh, through this devaluation um, we are going to have economic uh, progress but the fact is that we are a dependent economy we import uh, those countries that devalue their money and get uh, better are those that are productive. But we are consumers, we import. So what it means is that the more you devalue your currency, the higher and more expensive are the imported goods uh, in your own country. So that is what it means. And uh, we can't blame... Uh, the international uh, community along or the international system along. We have to blame ourselves, you know, the policies that we are doing and uh, the fact that uh, we keep on denying that these policies are what plunge us into such economic crisis and we still uh, blindly continue to pursue the same policies. Hmm. So, um, you know, coincidentally, we just spoke about our borrowings this morning, uh, external borrowings. And now, you know, it's being said that it's going to be to the tune of $45 billion by, um, by the end of 2024. So by January, we're looking at $45 billion. Why do you think we keep borrowing so much? And why are we not trying to pay back um, what we're borrowing? You see, when you cannot borrow and pay a debt, the more you borrow, the more you get uh, debt services. You incur debt services. So it's, it's one way. When you borrow, you are going deeper and deeper into the debt uh, trap. That is one thing. Secondly, like I said, it's because we keep on denying the fact this is our problem. And uh, you cannot borrow and then put it uh, in, in governance, you know, in, in the course of running governance, then there is high rate of uh, corruption and, uh, uh, you know, wastages. So these are the reasons why, even if we borrow, we'll go down deeper instead of coming out of the economic crisis, because the more we borrow, the more we consume it in unnecessary, you know, a post of governance, and there the is high level of corruption, there is high level of wastage. So that is why we are where we are now, and that is why we cannot be able to pay the debt. Secondly, if you look at the debt, there are no short-term debts. You know, once you borrow, uh, they give you certain conditions which is going to last uh, for how many years. And uh, now you cannot pay within ahead of time. You remember the time when Nigeria attempted to do that, but it was refused, it was rejected that uh, they cannot pay uh, upfront before the 
uh, the, 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 the due time. So these are some of the reasons why we are not able uh, to pay the debt. And unfortunately, yes, we are in the debt to keep on borrowing. And that's add to the problem that we are in. Mm, interesting. So there's another headline here that says, Tinubu's reform struggling to deliver meaningful results. And that's according to the IMF. I think it's quite ironical. <laughs> it's quite an irony for IMF, who's the one who's always giving us policies um, to implement. And now they're saying that Tinubu's reforms is struggling to deliver meaningful results. I want to get your take on this. Yeah, you see, if you read uh, the papers on Friday, uh, in part, this report is, is more sympathetic or uh, uh, listen to, to the whole process. What actually I may have said that uh, the reform had failed to deliver a meaningful report. In part, they compare us with Ghana and other African countries that they are making progress and we are going deeper into problems. So I think um, it's just a, a blame game. We are blaming IMF for the problem we are in, but they are in a way turn around to say that they are not to be blamed. After all, they have put all these things, we refuse to go with them. So I think this is one of the reasons why we are saying that our Nigerian leaders or our leaders in general should have a rethink that uh, what we are doing is a wrong way to go and that uh, these people will not feel ashamed. I mean, IMF and World Bank will not be ashamed to withdraw if we have no prosper problems. So I think the better we now uh, rethink our steps and take uh, another direction, uh, the sooner I think is the better we can get out of the problem. <laughs> But so one thing I've always asked is when it comes to policies and reforms, of course, there are obviously going to be certain peculiarities with each country or each state. Um, so I, I don't think they ever looked at our own peculiarities. But at this point, where we are today, how do you think that we can whip up our economy? How do you think we can do better? Or what do you think the, um, the president can do better if his reforms are obviously not yielding the type of results that was expected? Yeah, you see, the, the, the best thing that you can do is to, uh, you know, do away with this uh, IMF policy. Uh, if he find it impossible to do that, then the next step is uh, he has to cut the, go the cost of governance. Mm -hmm. Because that is where the huge amount of money, that the debt goes in. And he has to also leak wastages, leak up, I mean, uh, plug up the wastages. And above all, there has to be a serious, uh, you know, uh, control of uh, corruption because these are the three major things: wastages, uh, you know, uh, uh, high costs of governance, uh, which is also part of the wastages, and then corruption. So, if we are to do these things, I think we will be better off. But the best way, I think, is for the government to get out of this IMF uh, and World Bank uh, debt trap and uh, refuse to take it and abandon these things because there is no country that has developed with this recipe of IMF. So we cannot be an exception. Mm. Well, um, it says still on the, on the business energy that Nigeria economy reacting to both local and global pressures. So I'm hoping that they start to look for other measures or other means or better policies that would work, taking our own peculiarity, taking the nuances of what Nigeria can be, and not just um, taking a textbook approach of whatever IMF or the World Bank um, gives us. All right, let's move over to the punch. The punch obviously leads with, um, you know, elections. So it says, Ayedate was victory. INEC PDP disagree over alleged fraud in Undo poll. The writer here says, opposition says election was in history. INEC APC defends results and Tinubu governor um, and governors hail Ayedatiwa. So 
what do you think about the under state election they're calling it the worst election in history and i feel like this just sounds like a broken record every election now is like that's the exact word they love to use this especially the opposition like whoever doesn't win will always say this was the worst election in history and of course they have to approach the courts but i want to get your take on INEC, um the the polling on those states and how you think everything went about yeah, you see, uh, it, is, uh, it was predictable that uh, the election will go the way it uh, uh, went. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing is, even a week before the election, yeah, there are reports that um, uh, you go to banks, uh, they were cash trapped because po politicians were there, you know, earlier, and they got a um, huge amount of money. They withdrew all in preparation for the elections. Mm -hmm. So uh, from that one, one aspect that there is going to be brought by uh, the course of uh, what happened. And secondly, uh, we have to know that uh, the situation is there. Uh, the electorate, uh, you know, uh, deliberately impoverished, uh, uh, malnourished and others and so, which means they can be easily bought uh in course of the critical condition that they are in and um, but the most important factor is that um the politicians are all birds of the same pizza whether they are a ruling party or whatever wherever there is election whether each, each party will try to uh you know make sure that uh there is incumbency factor that they must come back uh, you know whether people like it or not, it is no performance that to determine. Uh, it's just because of that desperate uh, need uh, to win election. And thirdly, is the fact that uh, elections in Nigeria have been rendered to a uh, kind of uh, right race of religion. None of the parties goes into election with clean and clear mind that they are going to allow democracy to prevail. They all were there. Uh, to rig and outrig the other. So the one who wins is the one who successfully outrig the others. And um, uh, possibly is the fact that the politicians have now a cynical view that whoever wins will say go to court. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you know, going to court, uh, the, already the court has been compromised. And that if you go, it is not the substance of uh, the issue that matters, but uh, the technicalities that matters. So in most cases, uh, electoral offenses are considered as, um, I mean, they are thrown out not on substance, but on technicality. So these are some of the ways that our uh, elections uh, have, return, uh, have been uh, relegated. And this is why every election, uh, you know, that comes will be worse than the previous one. And we are taking to that, toward that one, which is a major threat to democracy, which is a major threat to uh, peace and uh, stability. Hmm. All right, so let's take other stories on the punch. We'll discuss the INEC elect, the um, Ondo election much later in the show. So, uh, Dangote Atman signed 240 million liters monthly petrol deal. Do you think for Nigerians, um, we would obviously get more supply on this and then maybe the pricing as well? No, you see, we are likely to get uh, more supplies, uh, but the pricing will not come down, unfortunately, uh, because we have said it several times in this show and in other shows that, uh, you see, what they are doing is they are pricing or oh, they are matching the cost of uh, oil in Nigeria with international uh, cost, uh, price. And once you do that, and once the Naira uh, devalues, so you say it, it, it doesn't take a, a rocket science to see that it is not come, the price will not come down because they are computing it in dollars. And already Naira is falling down like uh, 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 leaves of tree, you know, uh, in, in the dry season. So it is coming down that way. So that, so that is how uh, you will not get it. It, it will not come down. And the other thing why perhaps there is going to be availability of oil is that um, many people who own uh, traffic, I mean, vehicles have uh, decided to keep them. 
so that if you go around you see uh filling stations virtually empty because there are no cars no machines no this to uh, you know buy the fuel because of high uh, costs and uh, the fact is that the living standard of people have not improved uh, you know you are still uh, struggling with say uh, paltry uh, wages or let's say salary even if you implement the 70,000 naira, it will not, uh, you know, empower people to buy food because uh, they would rather go for uh, food than food. So uh, these are some of the reasons why you can see food uh, in filling station, but the price will not come down because the basic economic laws are not uh, applicable in Nigeria. And what we have is a greed of uh, the people and lack of um you know uh intervention by the government uh, and these are some of the reasons why even if Dangote will double the production it will not bring down the right. cost of uh, price I mean the price of oil as significantly as uh, possible well that's quite that's quite interesting um okay so let's look at other stories uh, you, you spoke about you know even the minimum wage so here it says minimum wage federal government to spend 6.5 trillion um naira and that's according to the ntef um but what do you think of the minimum wage and why i'm even linking this is because right now uh, having to buy fuel which is the bloodline of the economy obviously is quite expensive and minimum wage currently stands at 70,000 naira. That's the, you know, the general one, of which there are even states that haven't paid that or agreed to even pay that. And, of course, everything has gone up, the cost of transportation, food, inflation has, you know, taken over. And so um, we're seeing that people can barely use that minimum wage to even afford. In fact, I think that will give you less than 70 liters of, of petrol. Now, with that being said, there was an agreement that you know the the price of petrol was wasn't going to be increased as at that time when the minimum wage was being signed but now it has even been increased about twice since then what do you think the government is doing because now they are to spend about 6.5 trillion having to pay people this amount which is still not enough but what do you think they should be doing to ensure that People can still be able to afford the basic necessities of life with the minimum wage that is currently as the wage award right now. Now, you see, what, what the government needs to do is to ensure that they create an, an, an enabling environment for you know, people to be able to be self-reliant. Uh, it is not the dishing out of the minimum wage that matters. Uh, it is creating the environment where people will uh, be able to make a, a, a living. Uh, because if you now take it, the whole population of workers in Nigeria is not up to 10% of uh, the entire population. So by the time you concentrate on giving minimum wage to 10%, what of the remaining 90% who are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, workers? So I think that we, we deliberately, you know, target the, the minimum wage and the workers just in order to take the heat out of the system. Otherwise, it is a very simple thing that uh, the government will have done, and uh, that is the issue of, uh, you know, creating that conducive environment. And the conducive environment comes back to this issue of uh, subsidy that they have removed, the, the, the issue of devaluation of Naira, the issue of taxation and necessary taxation, increasing tax and other things, because the government is now seeing itself as an economic enterprise, which mm. is not seeing itself as a social, uh, you know, enterprise, which is what is the essence of government. We count uh, today; the government is counting itself by the, uh, uh, let's say, gain that it has made in terms of taxation, in terms of devaluation, in terms of you know subsidy removal. But the reality is that the more we pursue this, the higher, I mean, the deeper the crisis, uh, economic crisis and social crisis uh, we go into in Nigeria. So I let the government develop the political will to address this issue. That is uh, 
uh, uh, the only way that we can get out of the problem. But so long as we see governance as a, a business enterprise, I think uh, we are going the wrong way. We are backing uh, the, long, uh, the wrong tree. Mm. Because I would even expect that um, there should be other ways to generate revenue, especially maybe um, things that we're not exploring so much because we're not really doing so well with agriculture at the moment or tourism. And so, of course, insecurity has a role to play in that. But I feel like we should be looking at these measures, um, you know, just ways to ensure that we're generating revenue, diversifying, um, you know, our revenue generation in several ways and not just waiting for maybe crude or something like that. And since you were talking about, of course, inflation, um, devaluation of the Naira and stuff, so on The Guardian, uh, there's a story, there's a um, headline that says, you tied spending supply disruption to push inflation up 34.45% this month. So, of course, Christmas is coming. A lot of people are going to be doing a lot of spending. And now we're looking at inflation that might still go up again. I want to get your take on what we can do to mitigate this. Yeah, you see, uh, one thing is, uh, before we get the way out of it, is that even after Christmas, once with the inflation, once there is, uh, this rise, it will never come down. This is one thing with yeah. us. So like I said, our problem of uh, the inflation is partly, is partly, you know, greed. Uh, we we have to blame ourselves. Once we raise it, we never bring it down. And we are quick to raise, uh, you know, the price, the cost of things. But we are very slow or even reluctant to bring them down when there is improvement. So that is one dimension. The, but, but the serious dimension are the government policies that launch uh, the country into this so the way to mitigate it is what we have been saying since you know that uh, the government has the primary responsibility to consider itself that it is not a business enterprise and it, the measures that it is taking are the cause of the problem so if we accept and believe i believe and accept that uh, the measures we are taking are the cause of the problem so the way out of it is to now retract our steps and see how we adjust uh, in the business engine, which we didn't talk about uh, you know they said the the central bank rate uh, the, the uh, rate uh, 12 times in two years so we keep on raising and there are taxations that we are bringing you know more taxation you keep on raising the the, the borrowing costs uh, then you are borrowing more money there is wasted there is corruption these are the things that uh, yeah, you know we have to do if we are to mitigate the problem or if to solve the problem but unless we address these issues I think we will continue to be deceiving ourselves that uh, there is hope things will improve. You cannot get something improved without taking the actual step to bring it down. Mm. Well, so I know one thing that we cannot also uh, try to improve or not taking the step is putting your house in order and getting, um, getting foreign investors to come in. So. Um, the leading story here on The Guardian says, Leveraging shared history, Nigeria, India, to expand $7.5 billion trade ties. So that's the major story on The Guardian. So I know that, especially from last year, from when the um, president assumed office, one thing he has always tried to do was, you know, go out to look for foreign investors. And something that we've always said was, uh, here in Nigeria, do we even have a good environment for these investors to come in? Are we even... Um, you know, encouraging the local investors here before we're saying we want foreign investors. But I think it has paid off. The president now, you know, is already having trade ties with India. But I want to get your take on this. You know, moving forward, what do you think we need to do to attract, you know, the foreign investment that we need that could just help bolster our economy? You see, we have to look at why, what is securing the, uh, securing the foreign investors to come na to Nigeria, and what is uh, pro propelling them to live out of Nigeria. You see, we have to look at uh, what is scaring the foreign investors from coming to Nigeria, and what is propelling some who are already here to leave Nigeria and go other uh, places, to other places. Pass the issue of insecurity. 
You know, guys, investors are very sensitive. Uh, they are very conservative. They don't come to any place where there is uh, high insecurity. So the government has to address that issue if it wants to, uh, you know, get uh, foreign investors to come. Uh, secondly, uh, the government also has to create the conducive environment. The cost of production in Nigeria is very high. You know, sources of energy are beyond the reach. So that is why they are holding and they are moving to another place. Sadly, uh, the, the most investors are afraid to come, and those who are here are living because of corruption. So these are three things that what the government has, has to address in order to attract um, our investors. But most importantly, uh, I think the government has to do away with the issue of these foreign investors. Why can't we create our own system and develop? Uh, you know, foreign investors are here to make money. So they, they, they are not here to help us develop in the, in the real sense. They will just give us the minimum that we need and that they can in order to make uh, money out of it. But had it been we look inward and try to develop ourselves, like other countries, look at even some few African countries like Rwanda, like Ghana, that are looking inward, look at countries like the Asian Tigers. All they are doing is not uh, concentrate on foreign investors, but they concentrate on developing their own system internally, and uh, they are better off. So unless we shun away this issue of foreign investors uh, and uh, concentrate on trying to internally develop, uh, we will just be dancing in one place. Mm. Oh, well, um, I think that's how much we can take here on other press. I just hope that whatever our politicians are doing is ensuring that they're putting the right policies in place for Nigerians. We've spoken about a lot of things here. We've spoken about the economy. We've spoken about, um, you know, INEC. We've spoken about elections. Um, we're talking about a lot of things and I just hope that they listen and they just start to do what is right by the people of Nigeria. Professor Camille Sanifage, we want to say thank you so much for coming. It's always a pleasure having you on our show. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. All right, so we've been speaking with Professor Camille Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayori University, Kanu. And we've just been taking global stories that made it to the front pages of our national dailies. We'll go on a short break now. When we return, we're talking about the governorship election in Ondo State. So it's going to be on Do Decides. Please stay with us. <laughs>